Hi, Katarina. Hi, Victoria. How are you? I'm well, nice thank you. you. Yeah, nice to hear you too. How is everything? Everything is great. I'm outside right now on the porch at the beach, and it's beautiful and cold and windy and, and watching the sunset. Oh, beautiful. Are you in California? Yes, I or? am. Yes. Nice. Mm. That's nice. I just set up the, the presentation. Oh, the room looks fabulous. <laughs> you made it look great. Thank you. Oh, I'm <laughs> just reading the paper, too. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Paper shared. Good. All good. <laughs> yeah. This month is, is really busy. Next month, I still don't have that much planned. I have to catch up because I didn't do much last month, you know, mm -hmm. on vacation. So. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it'll fill. I, I... It will. <laughs> yeah, well, it, we since we planned this like two months ahead around so you know there's a delay in spots that are kind of but we'll have a few rooms it's fine <laughs> welcome friends who are arriving hey everyone feel free to join us on the stage to ask questions participate Hope everyone's doing well in the new year. Oh, shoot. I was, I was reading what I wanted to read. <laughs> it's actually in the top. Never mind. Uh, my question's answered. It's immune system uh, that I didn't read. I seen the molecular disabling switch and I, you perked my ears up big time. But um, immune system kind of defines it a little further that I wasn't exactly looking for. Well, maybe you'll be surprised and interested. For sure, maybe. Yeah, great. All right. Well, enjoy the talk. Thanks for coming. Well, it's really important, right? There's a lot of autoimmune disease um, and other, you know, diabetes is also falls under the category of autoimmune diseases. Um, even in cancer, it's important to know that switch uh, because cancer actively sometimes turns it off so it has really a broad range of yeah importance for health um so yeah. it will be really interesting i was, I was looking I, I didn't see reference in the two articles i'd read to autoimmune applications and that's what I, I was i mean everything is so important but i'm so curious about if that's if that's a part of this work as well or or ideas for well the anyway. yeah this work is to figure out the how it works like um, the you know the immune system molecular system but later on it will have implications i guess in those fields so yeah it was for sure hard enough to <laughs> to find that switch i mean it's, yeah it's really great work yeah, it's going to be great. Yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Feel free to share the room. Our guest speaker will be here um, soon. Uh, we'll start on top of the hour. In the meantime, feel free to check out the slides, the paper. Let me also share like a general public press release. Didn't I have it? A link so um, sometimes it's easier for people to understand what like the the context is and the significance oh welcome Hamish so happy to see you yeah welcome can you hear us the unmute but like the button to unmute is all the way on the bottom right there should be a little mic yep oh there you yeah. go oh good 
Cool. That's hot. Sorry, I didn't realize that button. How are um, you? Everything good? I'm good. Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Yeah. How's the connection? Sounds all right. Does it? Yeah, I can hear you well. Can you hear us well? Yeah, that I can hear fine, yeah. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, no, no, I'm good, thanks. Um, it's, um, yeah, it's different. It's, uh, so it's 1 p.m. here, almost. Yeah, and you have nice weather, no? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. What's it like? In, where are you? You're in New York? Right? Yeah, but it's a relative, for New York, it's a very mild winter so far. No snow. Oh, that's good. Not really. There were there were a few days where it got really cold, where stuff was freezing, but so far, not too much, okay. which is yeah, good. Right. And of course, bad in the bigger picture. I mean, Europe, same thing. My parents live in Germany and Portugal, and yeah, very yeah. much Germany too. Almost no yeah, snow. Yeah, right. Yeah, we had a really long winter. Like our winter's pretty mild, but it was like it seemed to go on for like way longer than normal. And but summer finally came and it's been really good. Like we've had like 30, 35 degrees for like about a week and now it's gone kind of cold again, but that's that's our weather's pretty unpredictable. Yeah, I think in Portugal the summers are not, at least in the north, the summers are not really that warm anymore. Um, like, I don't know. So it's yeah. been kind of weird, but. Yeah, we'll, yeah definitely. It was to be expected. It's not surprising. So I, I realized I, know, I didn't send you like a, um, a bio or anything, but I'm um, sorry about that. Oh, don't Thank worry. You, I'll check. I checked you out. No, I, I just went on the lab website and not released it. So, so <laughs> yeah, no worries. Yeah, yeah, no worries. It's probably um, it sounds yeah. That's probably creepy. what I would send you. <laughs> that's all right. No, no worries. I'm right. I think I did it to you as well. So don't worry. <laughs> Good. Okay. Um. Yeah. Welcome, everyone. Uh, hi, Katie. You want to come up? Um, yeah, uh, welcome everyone. We'll start in a few minutes. Uh, feel free to, in the meantime, take out the paper, the article, and the presentation. And um, welcome, Katie. Meet Hamish. Hello, how are you? Good, thanks. Your accent sounds familiar. <laughs> As does yours. Um, <laughs> welcome. I'm really excited for your presentation. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. How has your uh, start of the year been, uh, Katie? We haven't spoken in a few, like a few weeks, I think. So hope all is well with you. Yeah, everything's good. And how about yourself? Is It feels like too late to say Happy New Year, but Happy New Year since we haven't spoken. Um, but I'm excited for these rooms to be back and chatting with you all and nerding out on science. Yeah, thanks. Happy New Year to you too. And we'll have the Chinese New Year coming up. So it's this weekend, right? If I'm not mistaken. So we can say Happy New Year again. <laughs> it's always great to wish happy anything at any time, you know? I don't think there's there's too much of that. This is true. This is true. And hi, yeah. Victoria. Yeah, hello, Katie. Happy New Year. <laughs> Happy New Year. Just like the olden days. I know. So I know. People together again. It's good. It's going to be a good room. We're looking forward to this, Hamish. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm glad. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. So, <clears throat> uh, would you like me to get started or are you sort of waiting for? Oh yeah. You can relax for, yeah. for two more minutes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we, we start at the hour. Well, you're good. You can just relax and, and, um, we'll let you know. Okay. No worries. So where's, um, Katie, where, whereabouts are you situated and Victoria? 
I am uh, currently in like northern New South Wales, but I've been living oh, cool. um, in South Africa, gosh, for like 12 years. Ah, uh, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and Very I was nice. at the genetics department in at Stellenbosch University, so I'm really excited for your presentation. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, nice. <clears throat> cool. And Victoria, whereabouts are you? Right now I'm in Southern California and it's just beautiful outside. It was we had we had pretty exciting rains and flooding and uh, you know, like rivers overflowing their banks and train trestles getting washed away and that. But uh, it's calm today. It's just been so windy and now today it's it's really beautiful. Oh nice. And I just Great. enjoyed a fantastic sunset with just so orange and it's great <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> well i'm glad we got to all have a time to chat and meet and um i think we can start and hi mikita welcome i haven't seen you in a while too i hope all is well hello after a long time one of my favorite clubs every time thank you Being Okay, we can get started then. Uh, welcome everyone to Science Society and of course a special welcome to you Hamish. And uh, before we start, let me give um, like the audience a short introduction so they can get to know you a little bit. So um, uh, Hamish, he's a senior research fellow at the University of Melbourne <coughs> in Victoria, Australia. And he uh, went to a Christian college um, and then later did his bachelor with honors in biotechnology at Deakin University and then his PhD at Monash University in parasitology, immunology, vaccine development, biochemistry. And um, he, as I said, is a senior research fellow uh, in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at the Dorsey Institute. And he leads a team in the lab of Professor, uh, I hope I'm saying it right, Jose Dangush, uh, where he investigates how the immune system detects uh, pathogens uh, by a protein called MR1. And um, he, uh, Hamish did um, really um, advances in understanding how MR1 operates on the molecular level and he has been recognized and supported by several grants and prestigious awards. And it's such a pleasure having you here today. And we usually start off with an um, interview that is led by Victoria. So Victoria, the stage is yours. Thank you. All right, thank you, Thanks. Katarina. And, and Hamish, you see, um, even though you didn't send the bio, she has her ways. <laughs> yes. So, even, even my yeah. high school, you found somehow. <laughs> right? Yeah, she has her ways. Well done, Katarina. So now we're even more looking forward to hearing your research. And we'd also like to hear a little bit about you. So if you can, if you can share with us maybe where your passion came from. And, and by that, I mean, where do you feel that your first inclination towards science or maybe just affinity towards science surfaced in your life, even as a child or? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so um, I, I always loved um, just finding out how things worked and all that. I think um, it's probably something common to scientists. Um, and I remember a few memories, like I was really young, maybe I was like four or five. Um, actually, my family lived in the US for a few years um, and I was um, there and I went, I remember going to a museum and there was like all these, you know, animals and we were, we had these science classes there um, and it was just like really, I just loved it, every little bit of information. And I got a book on evolution and looking at the pictures of all the animals that, you know, um, were from for so long ago when the animals first left the oceans and things like that. And I've still got that book today. Um, and yeah, I think just when I got through school, um, I just loved learning about things and I, I thought I wanted to be a doctor for a long time. So 
it was always about uh, like a medical doctor because I, w- I was always interested in how the body worked. But then um, as I got through high school, it was just more actually about biology. And um, and so, I, yeah, I, I left um, high school and went to uh, university and just did a basically a straight science degree um, that was – in, that's how the way it works in Australia. And we sort of majored in biotechnology, but it was mostly cell biology and um, biochemistry. And yeah, I think I, I got to the end of university and realized that it everything started to synthesize. Like you learn about all these different parts, you know, um, like biochemistry, cell biology, genetics, and you start to get a bit of a picture. Like it starts to fit together. And I just love that. And then I started research and yeah, fell in love with research. So that's probably a bit of a history of my love for science. Thank you so much. That was that was really um, that was very smooth storytelling. I feel like you took us along this whole this whole pathway, and it was really great to hear about your early memories of going to the museum. And it it's you know it's just very encouraging to always always share things that are important with youth. You know, like share science, share share what you love yeah. is what I'm trying to say. I'm, I'm here visiting family now um, in Southern California, and we're right near, I don't know if anybody knows what the, the tar pits, the L.A. tar pits are. It's, it's, oh, yes, um, I went there. Yeah. Okay, I was wondering where you were when you were describing these museums. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, and so you see that. Yeah, so you've seen that. Yeah, I did, but I um, I went there on a trip recently. Oh, it was like about five years ago. I was in, um, yeah, the U.S., and I went I went there. Um, that, that's near the big uh, art gallery, isn't it? Um, mm-hmm. Adjacent, completely uh, right there. Yeah, that's where I grew yeah. up, and and so to see those, to see the fossils coming out, and to actually be walking, walking, you know, you can reach down and touch the tar that that the the woolly mammoths and the saber toothed tigers were just they were drowned in there but you can see it and so it's amazing that you can think i'm walking in the same in the footsteps of these creatures and and it just yeah. kind of sticks with you you know like like yours did and and so yeah thank you for for also explaining you know that things synthesized after you built on built on your studies and it's kind of like you had this science vocabulary and then can you please uh you said you started research how did you from your beginning of your research how did you come to the research that you will present to us today yeah so yeah that's been quite a journey as well um and you know in science i think it's like most of us you you can't really plan where things go it's sort of just you fall fall into opportunities usually or you you know you take opportunities and so i did um my honours degree, which is like a, it's in Australia, it's very different from the US, but it's a one year research focused um, end of the degree. And so I did that uh, thesis on this parasitic disease of um, salmon. Um, that's when salmon are in aquaculture, when they're farmed, they get, they often get stressed and their immune system goes down, they get this disease on their gills. Anyway, I was doing research on that. Ooh. And then... Yeah, and then, and then I ended up just sort of working on parasites for a number of years, um, and um, I went to Edinburgh, um, the UK, before I did a PhD and um, and worked on a horse parasite. So I jumped around, and and then I did my PhD on schistosomiasis, which is a um, also known as a blood fluke. It's one of the um, you know most prevalent diseases in uh, in the world, really. Like um, it causes chronic illness in people in developing countries, and um, uh, and that's a fascinating parasite. You know, the, the life cycle is just um, crazy. Um, it goes from snails to mammals, and I actually worked on um, the, the Asian schistosomiasis, um, and that's that's in China. Although it is um, reducing, I think as um, conditions improve in the rural parts, um, but. They so I was there um, collecting samples from buffaloes and collecting snails in the field and, and that was you know um, a very exciting time and and then at the end of that I think I, I always just was very interested in the fundamentals and you know how do molecules work in order to dictate what you see happening on the larger scale um, and so I I was looking for a postdoc position and I was staying local so I was 
I did my PhD in Melbourne, Australia, and I wanted to um, stay there due to family reasons. And, um, and there's a lot of really good immunology in Melbourne. And I, I mentioned before that I was interested in the medical side of science. So I thought I'd see how it went, you know, trying to get a postdoc in immunology. And I, yeah, I went to work for um, Professor Jose Villadangos, who's, um, I'm still in his lab now as nine years later. And so um, I, I was sort of lucky to get, he advertised the project and the position and it was, it just really struck a chord with me because it was all about this protein called MR1, which I'll explain to you today. And, um, and I was lucky enough to get that job. So it was a bit of a sideways step into something new, but I used a lot of the skills that I'd learned from parasitology, like the basic lab skills and biochemistry skills. Yeah, so I um, yeah started working and then fell in love with a new um, um, area, which was this protein called MR1. <laughs> so, yeah, and thank you. Just, that, that, and, yeah, sorry, was I cutting you off or or that? Was... No, no, that's that's about it. Yeah, yeah, because we're here with MR1 today, right? Yeah, so your your pattern of your um, yeah kind of a pattern of inquiry is brings us here and it's 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 interesting to hear about that path because as we listen to your research then maybe we can think of um you know also reasons why you might have gone in different directions considering considering where you've been so at this point i will um, pass the mic completely over to you and you can dive into your discussion and then know that we are all here at your service um, to help with questions that people may put in the chat or also friends on stage will have for you. And I want to welcome Dr. Shaw. It's so nice to see you and welcome Eli also to the stage. And so yeah. Hamish, yeah, the mic is yours. We're all so happy and welcoming to you. Yeah, great. All right, thanks so much. Um, okay, so I'll get started and um, if, if anyone wants to ask questions on the way, I don't mind doing that. I'm not sure if that's the um, that's the yeah. general principle, but um, sorry, my little three year old's coming to ask me a question. Do you mind? Just, <laughs> I'm just giving a call back. No worries. Awesome. Do you mind showing mama? Take your time. I want to start with mama. <laughs> oh, good. I'm just talking to some people on Hold the internet. Up. I'm here. Okay, perfect. Thanks. All right, I'll see you soon, okay? Okay. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, I've got a little boy called Atlas. I'm actually, uh, yeah, maybe I should start with this, letting you know that I'm um, I'm actually, the, like, at the moment, the stay-home dad for a, a few months um, because um, I, my wife had a, a baby uh, in May and so now I'm looking after both. So um, it's a real privilege. Actually, Australia has very fortunate a lot of the, my university has really good conditions for um, parental leave so um, also for fathers to take it so my wife's been able to return to work so I'm going to return to the lab in February um, we so, absolutely <laughs> love that yeah and, and no worries yeah, if your very, child interrupts um, I know what it's like yeah <laughs> <laughs> many of us multitasking parents do so don't worry yeah, uh, exactly. it's actually a really good example, you know, of real life. So please, yeah, that's um, right. Take yeah, help Atlas. Right. Atlas is welcome here. <laughs> and, and the fact that like a, a wealthy country cannot have its economy collapse if they offer such benefits. Yes, equal yeah. maternity leave. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I know. And um, I mean, yeah, it's it's one of those things that. I, I sort of felt like it was almost indulgent for me to do it for a while, but then I realized that, you know, the situation that equal opportunities is never going to get better if, if it's just the mothers that have to stay home and don't get the opportunity to follow their, you know, dreams as well. So um, anyway, it is, it's very, I, I feel very fortunate to be able to do it um, because I spend time with my kids, but um, I do also miss the science, so I do work a bit in the evenings. You know, I've got some students and keep in touch with them and, and all that. But anyway, Mama. we'll. Um... Mama, I don't want <laughs> Sorry. Uh, anyway, we'll move on. We'll, we'll get into the. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm just all right. You, 
Just you could it. also, if you need to press your mute button for a second to have a little privacy, you can do that and come back whenever you can. Yeah, that, all right, I'm going to mute no, for one no minute. I'll, I'll back. Yeah, yeah. Right. Take, take care of what you need. We're good. We're happy. We'll talk amongst ourselves. Yeah, hi, it's Katie, and just maybe it's a good opportunity to say to anyone that's listening in the audience as well, um, I know that we've got some new people in the room, um, please click on the presentation that's at the top and you can follow along with us as Hamish goes through. Um, Katarina also has put in the chat um, links to the scientific studies as well. Um, if anyone has questions along the way, um, as Hamish said, he's happy to answer them. So you can pop them in the chat um, or feel free to raise your hand. There'll be time for questions and answers at the end and um, we'll make sure that we get to you all. Um, but yeah, again, like really love the multitasking life. I'm sure many of you that know me when I'm with my girls too, <laughs> you can hear them running around in the background and um, yeah, amazing chat about maternity leave and, um, you know, working parents life because, you know, that's what many of us do these days. Yeah, I wanted to also add, there was a study in Portugal since they started that um, uh, men can also take parental leave it um it uh, improved also the health of the relationship of the parents um that's what showed the study since you know both know how it is to like participate as equal partners and you know educate like being there for the children and work so apparently it's also good for the parents so Anyways, him is just back. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> Welcome. Right, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um, I don't want to make all this about you know about that, but it, it's a very in inter interesting and important discussion, isn't it? I mean, but anyway, my three-year-old wanted to hang out with me, which is lovely. But um, he's um, he's gone with his mum now, so all good. Um, okay, so I'll get started. Um, and um, and and so essentially, what I I'm going to talk, I know that you have very diverse um, talk, speakers and audience as well. Um, and so um, what what we work on, I'm going to try and um, give you, start with, you know, a broader description, um, but then in order to explain the paper, I'm going to go into, you know, the nuts and bolts of the mechanics of what's happening in the cell. And so what we, what I try and work on is understanding how, um, the immune system works from essentially with inside the cell um, because there's all these molecular processes that then drive what happens um, at the macro scale in the body. And I've always, that's what I've I realized once I started in this area, even though it's just working on one protein, that's what I love. So I'm going to go into those details. If at all if something's not clear, feel free to um, please stop me. So, um, yeah, I was really um, happy that um, Katarina asked me to present this paper. So we published this towards the end of last year. Um, and um, it was from my first um, PhD student who's finished now and her name's Hui Jing Lim. And you can see on the first slide there that that's her photo. So she was from Malaysia and joined us in the lab and um, uh, did her PhD. And this is um, the paper from her thesis. And now she's actually a postdoc um, at Yale, which I was really um, happy for her to get that position. And so, um, all right, I'll explain what's happening um, in this paper. So the title is a specialized tyrosine-based endocytosis signal in MR1 controls antigen presentation to mate cells. Um, and there's the details there. I think you can probably get the paper, but actually I'll just let you know, my email address is there and I'm happy to chat to anyone if you want to contact later. And I'm also on Twitter there. Okay, so broadly, as um, you may know, the immune system um, is very complicated um, and there's a lot of players involved. And without going into all the details, I've got a diagram of the main sort of cell types that are in the mammalian immune system, but this is even a simplification, really. And so we have like these two halves of the immune system. One is the innate system, uh, and these are cells that respond really quickly to any sort of threat or pathogen that might break the barrier in, and get into your body. Um, and they have, um, they're sort of, they're termed nonspecific because they don't really respond to just one strain. They often respond to a whole class of, 
of uh, pathogens such as you know gram positive bacteria certain molecules from all of those will um, stimulate those cells and then there's if if the pathogen can get past the innate system then the adaptive system kicks in um, and that is very specific and and can be much more powerful to tackle that infection um, although the adaptive response takes you know um, up to a week to sort of really get started and so in the middle of these two there's now these other cells that have been you know in the past couple of decades recognized as being important and they're called um, these innate like lymphocytes or um, innate like t-cells and so these are gamma delta t-cells nk t-cells and also this other subset called mate cells and that's what i'm um, mostly interested in and so there's a process that adaptive um, cells such as the the T cells, which are the main part of the adaptive response, or one major part, um, need, and that's called antigen presentation. And so, whereas the innate cells can detect these molecules directly, adaptive cells actually need the antigen or these foreign molecules to be presented to them in a certain context by other cells. So that's called antigen presentation. So you can imagine one cell, I'll go to the next slide now, so on slide three, the next slide shows that you know um, T cells to get activated need to have the antigens presented. So the blue cell is what we call an antigen presenting cell, and at that synapse, there's an MHD molecule, and it has a small fragment of a um, pathogen or a foreign um, organism within that. That's that little green blob, and the T cell has a matching T cell receptor that detects um, both the MHD molecule and that. Um, foreign um, molecule there. So you can see the situation is quite complicated already, but this allows for a really fine-tuned um, instruction to the powerful T cells in order to, you know, when to respond, how to respond, and in what way, because the antigen presenting cell can provide other signals in the form of like um, soluble molecules called cytokines and other receptors that can tell the T cell to either you know, respond to this um, foreign antigen or not respond um, or and what type of response um, to, to happen. So our lab, and particularly my lab head, um, Jose Villadangos, has been working on antigen presentation for a long time. And when I joined, um, uh, no one really knew how this new, MR, this new MHG molecule called MR1, it was newly recognised, how that works. So... Um, I'm going to explain to you one important part of how it works today. So on the next slide, so slide four, I'm going to introduce these mate cells. So um, mate cells are your most likely, um, as far as we know, your most abundant T cell that's in your body. And they're really powerful. They have very strong immune um, functions. And so the name mate um, stands for mucosal associated invariant T cells. And it's because they were first found mostly enriched in the mucosal tissues, so in the gut and the lungs. But they've actually since been found that they're pretty much everywhere in your body, even in your brain. Um, and um, they're just, they're extremely uh, numerous. And um, so the invariant part refers to them, their T cell receptor doesn't really change much. And that's really different to most of the T cells in your body. Because you, we all have... Um, potentially billions of types of T cells that can respond to billions of types of um, different antigens. But mate cells are very different in that they um, have the same type of T cell receptor that recognizes the same type of antigen presented by um, the same molecule, MR1. And so we think it's really important to understand how this happens. So what do mate cells do? Well, they can sense pathogens because MR1 presents these small molecules that come from bacteria and that results in immunity. So they can, um, so for example, humans uh, or mice that lack mate cells um, generally do worse for a lot of bacterial infections. Um, and there's some humans that have had mutations that result in them not having mate cells. And um, they also um, often have uh, um, some recurrent infections. And, but the other thing that mate cells do, which is really, an interesting and emerging area is that they 
they sense commensals and respond accordingly. So it's not just pathogens because the antigen they recognize comes from all different types of bacteria. So they sense commensals and then they can help repair the body. So in this diagram, this is like a mucosal layer. And you can imagine there might be a breach in that barrier um, where all these little green bacteria might be able to enter the tissue. So an antigen presenting cell can capture some of the antigen and present it on ML1 and turn on the mate cells, effectively turning on the immune system because these innate cells, uh, mate cells, can respond really quickly, unlike other T cells that take a long time to get going. They respond really quickly and they actually recruit different T cells and they um, cause dendritic cells to mature. Um, and it's a real, um, it's, it's like it's really kickstarting the immune system immune system, immune response, that's what they do. So we are very interested in what controls their activation, how does MR1 work? So a bit more about MR1, without going to these chemical structures in too much detail, it's, MR1 is a really fascinating job because what it does is it actually presents these small um, vitamin-related metabolites that come from bacteria. So I'm on slide five now. Um, and so inside bacteria, most bacteria synthesize their own riboflavin um, and as, as an essential um, uh, vitamin, and it's vitamin B2. And we don't actually synthesize it. We get it all from our diet and also from our commensal bacteria that synthesize it. And so for organisms like bacteria and yeast as well that make riboflavin, if you've done any biochemistry, you know that to synthesize a, a complex molecule, there's a number of um, synthetic steps along the way and one of the small intermediate steps um, is this molecule called 5-ARU and that combines with these other small molecules to form the actual antigen um, for example the main one is called 5-OPRU here so MR1 captures that small molecule um, within this little what's called an antigen binding cleft and then it um, presents it to the T-cell receptor so no other MHD molecule presents metabolites like this. They all present peptides, um, as um, you may be aware, to conventional T cells, like the killer CD8 T cells, um, or some of them present lipids. But this is the first molecule that's ever found that captures um, bacterial metabolites and presents it to T cells. And the, the significance of this is that these metabolites only hang are very short-lived because they're very um, susceptible to... Um, to being degraded. So if MR1 finds these metabolites around, it suggests that there is a microbe and it's living and it's synthesizing riboflavin, so it's essentially growing. So MR1 is sort of presenting this me metabolite signature of a living bacteria. Um, and these are really ubiquitous. Pretty much every bacteria we have, or, you know, probably, a, I'm not sure what the number, but it's more than say 90% synthesized riboflavin. So it's a very common antigen. So because MR1 is actually expressed by pretty much all of our cells and that the antigen is very abundant, so why are mate cells not continuously activated? And so we're trying to understand how MR1 works um, in those antigen presenting cells. Um, and in order, and I'm on slide six, sorry. and um, in order to maybe find a way that we can manipulate mate cells, which are, to remind you, are your most abundant T cell. Perhaps in immunocompromised individuals or um, elderly, where their immune response is not um, what it once was, um, and they're susceptible to um, bacterial infections such as pneumonia, um, we could boost their immune response. And there's also the scope for cancer immunotherapy, because maybe we could turn these abundant T cells to fight tumours and there's some really exciting work that's been come out about that. So <clears throat> I'll explain what we found about MR1 briefly because it has a, a lot of really fascinating elements to it. And one that I think was the most interesting that we found early on was that MR1, as you imagine, needs to get to the cell surface to present its antigen in order for the T cell to bind and re recognize that as a, as a receptor. But in fact, what people knew for a long time was that it wasn't at the cell surface at all. It was pretty much all buried inside the cell. So how does it actually get to the surface? 
So what we found is that normally in the healthy um, steady state, um, all MR1 is within the cell. So it's sort of, um, it's off. It can't signal to the mate cells. But during an infection, um, these bacteria will release the metabolites and they enter the cell by unknown mechanisms, but they get inside, deep inside the cell in an area called the endoplasmic reticulum or the ER. Um, so on slide seven, you can see um, the bottom box shows that these metabolites are getting in, um, maybe from an intracellular bacteria or from outside the cell, and they load onto MR1. And so MR1 is sitting there waiting just in case there's a metabolite coming around. Once it does bind, that causes a conformational change, like a change in the structure of MR1, and that rapidly traffics it to the cell surface. <clears throat> So the metabolites turn MR1 on essentially, and MR1 is like an alarm system that signals to the mate cells that there is a, um, a microbe living you know, nearby. And so once it's been at the cell surface, it needs to be turned off. And so the next slide, slide eight, um, I'm just highlighting this part of the, the pathway that we realized um, <clears throat> over a few years ago that MR1, once it's at the cell surface, you know, when you expose cells in the top graph on the right, you expose cells to the metabolite 5-OPRU and MR1 goes up. And then if you take away 5-OPRU over the next eight hours, MR1 goes back down. But no one knew how that worked. And that to us was really uh, important because it's a way that you turn off the signal to, to, to stimulate mate cells. And it's not just that it goes inside to hide, but it actually goes inside and gets destroyed. So that's what that um, Western blot shows at the bottom where you've got MR1, which is um, the black blob, and you can see that gradually disappears over time. So we wanted to figure out how that was happening. So this is where Hui Jing uh, Lim's PhD project um, came in. Um, so she found that MR1, we have this assay to be able to measure how fast MR1 is internalized. And that on slide nine, that's the top uh, graph. Um, there on, on the left. And so with primary T cells, so um, primary PBMCs from uh, human blood, different lymphocytes and um, monocytes, you can see that MR1 is internalized constantly over four hours, but at different rates depending on the cell type. So in monocytes, it gets internalized quite rapidly, whereas in B cells, it gets internalized quite slowly. And the same thing, similar happens um, in the cell lot, two different cell lines. Um, the THP1 and C1R cell lines. So to start to figure out how that, how it is being internalized, we tried different inhibitors of uh, endocytosis. Endocytosis is the mechanism for, by which surface proteins get internalized. And we found that within, with our two cell lines, if we use this inhibitor called PITSTOP2, which inhibits clathrin mediated endocytosis, which is a major pathway, proteins getting internalized, um, that really stopped the amount of MR1 that gets internalized. So we realized that it must be some kind of clathrin mediated endocytosis. And so on slide 10, this is where we, we use a very cool technique called um, genome-wide um, CRISPR-Cas9 um, screening to try and figure out exactly which gene was responsible um, for internalizing MR1. And these, these I'm not sure if, if, if you're aware of, of this, I mean, I'm sure you've heard of CRISPR, but um, the genome-wide um, screening is such a powerful tool that, I mean, it was a bit of a long shot, but we thought we'd give it a go. And we've done a few screens now and they, um, they generally work quite well. Um, so just to explain what happens, um, it's a way to knock out every single gene in the genome and then to see in a separate cell. So you have a large pool of cells and every gene gets knocked out in a different cell. And then you can sort out the cells that have a certain phenotype or um, a certain um, yeah, phenotype that you're looking for. So for us, we, would, we, we could see the MR1 slowly went down over time. Um, and so we thought we'll knock out every gene in the, in the pool of cells and then we'll isolate the cells that still have high MR1, so they don't behave normally because normal cells will drop off MR1 over time. 
but we'll isolate the cells in that pool that can't internalize MR1 anymore. And, and then we'll find out what the knockout is in that cell because that should be the, the protein coming from the gene that was knocked out is responsible for probably internalizing um, or degrading MR1. So when we did that, we found one hit, which is um, normally with these screens, you find a few hits, but that can also mean that it's a bit confusing to know which one is, is the main, is the one um, that is actually mediating the effect. But we found this one really strong hit, it's called AP2A1. And this gene uh, was enriched in all of our, uh, almost all of our repeats, our technical repeats. And with these screens, you have six different guide RNAs, so you can knock out the gene potentially six different ways. And almost all of those as well, um, it was enriched in the MR1 high cells. So that suggests that that particular knockout is mediating, is stopping MR1 being internalized. So we were quite lucky to get that, but then I'm not sure if it's luck. I just think that these screens are, are you know, amazing. Um, so we, I'll just explain to you what AP2A1 is. So it's part of um, a complex, a protein complex called AP2, and it's a um, it's a clathrin adaptive um, complex. So automatically we we thought, okay, this has got to be it. And if you look, um, so this is slide 11, if you look on the diagram on the right, you've got um, uh, the, the plasma membrane there in grey and there's the receptors in black on the cell surface and you could just say that's like MR1. And what AP2 does is bind to part of the intracellular domain and then clathrin binds to AP2 and then that enables essentially the recruitment of that receptor into these um, vesicles that form. And so um, these vesicles then um, are endocytosed um, into the cell and then uh, um, the clathrin and AP2 um, get removed from that. And then um, that's just the way that AP2 selectively captures um, proteins to be uh, internalized in endocytose. So there's four different subunits of AP2 and one of them is called AP2A1. So it seemed from our screen that when you knocked out AP2A1, MR1 wasn't um, internalized um, efficiently anymore. So we thought we were onto um, something pretty interesting. So uh, we knocked out AP2A1 um, in two different ways in our cell line that we often use. So just to show you on the top left, here's that, you know, um, two knockouts that have um, AP2A1 is in the two control wild type cell lines, but you can't see the protein anymore in the two knockouts. And then we use these to study how uh, how these knockouts affected MR1. And um, so on the top graph on the right, this is slide 12, um, you can see that, um, that in our knockout cell lines, which is the blue line, the MR1 goes up at a much faster rate um, and then is slowly internalized. So these cells have a higher MR1 surface expression and it suggests that it's not being internalized and degraded. And so when we internalize, we measured the internalization rate in the bottom left graph, you can see that, uh, that again, the AP2 knockout cells have a much lower rate of internalization than wild type cells. Um, and there's another protein called transferrin receptor, which is all of our cells have that um, and that is what helps our cells take in iron. And the transferrin receptor, um, which is a, that's a known um, cargo for AP2. So AP2 binds to the cytoplasmic domain of transferrin receptor and internalizes it. So that's like a control. So we could say with our knockouts that, yeah, it was still, it was also infecting internalization of transferrin receptor. And we also found that it was quite interesting. There's been a bit of debate in the literature that because um, once MR1 gets internalized, a little bit can be recycled, which means that once it's been pulled inside the cell, it can also be sent back out. While tr other proteins like transferrin receptor get recycled to a really high degree, MR1, there's only a tiny bit that comes back out. Um, and there was always a bit of a debate in the literature, just you know whether that is actually important for MR1 um, signaling to mate cells or not. <clears throat> and I'll get into that a little bit later. 
Um, however, we found that when you knock out AP2A1, you, you also decrease the recycling to like by about 70%. So we wondered if MR1, you know, this suggests that MR1 probably is a cargo that AP2 binds to, and AP2 is there to sort of turn off MR1 signals. So we thought this is, you know, the next um, part of the MR1 story that we'd like to probe. And so it's really well known what type of proteins the AP2 binds to. And the first, on slide 13, the first uh, type of protein that it binds to is proteins that have this motif called a tyrosine-based motif, which is the Y uh, for tyrosine, XX for any amino acids, and then a fire residue. And I'll get into that um, in the next slide. And there's other types of motifs, um, which is in yellow, that binds to. But MR1 did have something that looked a bit like that tyrosine-based motif. So on slide 14, what we did was we looked to see if there was any um, of these tyrosine-based motifs. And what we found was that pretty much it was 80% of all mammalians' MR1 sequences have a conserved tyrosine residue. Um, and, the, and they also have a conserved proline. But at that third position after the tyrosine, they don't really have what, what would be a canonical fire residue, which is that, um, that Greek fire symbol. Um, because that fire is usually um, one of these five hydrophobic amino acids. So valine, isoleucine, leucine, methionine, phenylalanine. So normally one of these residues would be found in that fire position, but MR1 has this really conserved threonine residue. So we thought that was um, a bit unusual. So, <clears throat> but we considered that it could have um, a tyrosine that's needed to bind to the AP2 protein, um, but it the, the, it lacks that, that uh, fire residue. So perhaps it's sort of like a non-canonical uh, motif. So we wanted to um, investigate that. So as I said, that the tyrosine based motif in MR1, while being a little bit unusual, but it was very highly conserved. So look, at, I'm just showing you some interesting animals uh, as well as our um, standard Australian um, marsupials, like the wombat, um, but it's also conserved in the donkey and the blue whale. So um, just to give you an idea of how conserved it is, and MR1 is, a, is one of the, is a very highly conserved protein as well. So we went ahead and made some mutants of these residues in, in that motif to see which one is important for internalization. And um, here's a bit of a schematic, so I'm on slide, slide 16, uh, on a schematic of the MR1 tails. And you can see that, um, so we made, uh, we, we firstly concentrated on the residues around that, that motif. So we made a mutant called Y313A. So we converted the tyrosine to an alanine. Um, and then we also converted the tyrosine to a phenylalanine, which is F. And I've shown the side chain structures there. So you can see the phenylalanine is very similar to the um, tyrosine um, motif, but the, the alanine basically, it lacks that aromatic ring. And then we made a series of other mutants, including cutting off the tail completely. And the very last mutant we, we made was to add a GFP protein onto the end because we already had that. We actually used that um, to image MR1 by microscopy. So just looking at MR1 internalization and the graph on the top right, there was only really one, uh, aside from GFP, it was that uh, y through on 3 a mutant. So when we made that mutant, it significantly decreased the amount of MR1 that was internalized. So it suggests that that's really important for interacting with AP2, and we we hypothesise that's probably the case anyway. Um, and so also at the very end of the graph, when we add the GFP, that seems to interfere as well, and that's probably blocking the proteins from binding to the MR1 tail. So just to show you on the bottom, if um, if you remember earlier, I showed that when we knocked out AP2A1, that reduced the internalization of MR1. And on the right, you see a very similar thing when we just make that single mutation in MR1. So we convert that tyrosine to an alanine. <clears throat> so it seems like MR1 has a very conserved tyrosine. It's essential for internalization, and that's probably dependent on binding to the AP2. So 
we tried many different ways to see if um, MR1 and AP2 actually interact. Um, and if you work at all in cell biology or biochemistry, you know this is something very standard and reviewers will always ask for it. <laughs> if you suggest that two proteins interact, then um, they want to see it. So it turns out it's very hard to do because MR1, uh, AP2 interaction with other proteins is a very quick and like transient um, process. Um, but we ended up um, using a method called, which is the microscopy method. So I'm on slide 17 now, sorry. Um, and this is called the proximity ligation assay. And so uh, what the way this works is that when two proteins, <clears throat> if you look at the little diagram, the cartoon on the top left, <clears throat> if MR1 and AP2 proteins are very close proximity um, in within the cell, then the two antibodies against each of those proteins will be very close together. And then you get the proximity ligation assay spot, which is a spot of fluorescence occurring. So if you look at the black or dark microscopy images, at the top row, each of those little white spots inside is a point of interaction between the two proteins. And so we tried different conditions. <clears throat> and when we used um, HeLa cells that overexpressed MR1, um, we didn't see many spots, but only we saw more spots when we added the fluorescent. Sorry, when we added the MR1 ligand, which is in the very last um, column of both the graph and the microscopy images. So I realised I didn't really um, mark that very well. And so we it suggested the MR1 and the AP2 were interacting just when the cells were exposed to the ligand. Sorry, the the metabolite. <clears throat> And we used PLA with two different types of antibodies at different subunits of AP2, and it, the same thing happened. So it suggested that MR1 doesn't actually interact with AP2 normally, but when the when that metabolite sends MR1 to the plasma membrane, the cell surface, then you actually do see the interaction um, with AP2, and that makes sense because AP2 is only really act is only active at the plasma membrane. That seemed to suggest to us that it is interacting. Um, and uh, we then were able to show that when you mutate that tyrosine, um, the amounts of PLA spots uh, also reduces significantly. Um, so the, that's looking at the gray compared to the, the purple dots there. So again, that suggests that um, even though in that tyrosine mutant, there's, there's actually more MR1 present in the plasma membrane, but when you don't have that tyrosine, um, you don't get the interaction with P with the um, AP2 complex. So we we're really able to show that MR1 um, interacts with AP2 and it's very dependent on having that, that one tiny amino acid, that um, tyrosine. Okay, so um, we found, uh, um, I'll, maybe I won't go into this too much detail, but we found that MR1, uh, that cells that lack AP2 um, have not only do they have more MR1 surface expression, but they present antigen for a longer time um, using um, these chemically modified MR1 metabolites. And so on slide 20, um, we, uh, we, we found that, yeah, the same thing occurred when we used cells that were the antigen presenting cell in blue, and we could stimulate this mate cell. It's like a mate cell line. Uh, and um, when we knocked out AP2A1, those cells sort of had unregulated um, stimulation. So for a longer time, when they were just exposed to the metabolite antigen for a short time, they would continue to present MR1 antigen to stimulate the T cells. So this suggests that having AP2 you know, in the cell is important in order to turn off the um, stimulation of that really abundant T cell. And so I... I alluded to the point earlier on that <clears throat> that um, some labs had considered that the recycling of MR1, so I've highlighted, so on slide 21, I've highlighted in red here part of the, um, the schematic where MR1 that's at the cell surface can be internalized, but then it can be pushed back outside. So that's called recycling. And some labs think that that's important because <clears throat> it could be internalized to a part of the cell where some bacteria might be living and so and that does make a lot of sense because the bacteria are going to make the antigen so maybe MR can head there 
capture some manager and then return to the cell surface. But no one really knew whether, was that really important for MO and presenting or not? Because we'd previously found that most of the antigens um, bind to MR1 when it's inside the endoplasmic reticulum. So, but the the very difficult aspects to separate because usually when you affect one thing in the cell, you affect everything else as well. When, so this is one of the caveats of doing sort of cell biology assays. <clears throat> so, but we found this was actually the unique um, opportunity because when we knocked out AP2A1, the recycling of MR1 was reduced by around 70%. So even though MR1 was still able to load antigen in the ER and head to the surface and present, um, those molecules weren't really recycling very efficiently. And we think this is because MR1, sorry, AP2 isn't there to send it to the right um, location. So with this model in mind, we thought, well, now we can actually test is recycling important or not. So what we did is we infected our antigen presenting cell with three different types of intracellular bacteria. And so we used Salmonella, um, Shigella, and Burkholderia. Um, so this is on slide 22. And this graph shows the amount of activation that we saw in those mate cells. And on the and we so we used wild type cells, which is the white bar, the controls. Um, the AP2A1 knockouts in blue and the MR1 knockouts in red. So basically the MR1 knockouts don't really stimulate the mate cells. Those cells don't get stimulated. Um, whereas controls and the AP2A1 knockouts were equal of their ability to stimulate mate cells. So this really strongly suggested that if cells can't recycle MR1, it didn't really matter for being able to present the intracellular antigen. Um, so it meant that recycling was probably dispensable. It's not important for being able to stimulate mate cells. That's a bit of an aside. It doesn't really explain a lot about um, that. You know, it, it, it's more just an uh, in, interesting part of MR1 and sort of settled a, a dispute for a long time, in my mind anyway. All right, so um, sort of getting towards the end, um, we, um, we wanted to figure out why does MR1 in its motif have this, um, this threonine in, in the position that other proteins have a valine, sorry, yeah, often a valine or this um, fire residue? Because threonine is not hydrophobic at all, but the valine and all these other fire residues are these hydrophobic residues. So what we decided to do was to simply mutate that threonine to become a valine and then see what happened. And we also um, did a, a similar um, mutation, well, we we swapped the tail of another MHC protein called CD1D that has a uh, canonical uh, motif, um, and then we all, we just swapped that tail onto MR1 to see what happened as well. Um, but essentially they both have the valine in the position that you would say an AP2 protein is recognised by. So on slide 24, um, we can sort of just go through this data pretty quickly, but in A, when we made these two mutations, you can see that MR1 is now increased, is internalized much more rapidly. And um, it's also recycled much faster. So this is really opposite to what we saw when we mutated the tyrosine. When we, when we mutated the tyrosine, MR1 was internalized and recycled much lower. But now when we um, make the motif look like a canonical AP2 um, sequence, now the internalization and recycling is, is gone up really high. And it was interesting that even though the, these mutant MR1s were recycled much faster, and, um, but that didn't help at all for MR1 presentation. In fact, the presentation was decreased. But this is also the opposite to what we saw with the tyrosine mutant. And on slide 25, um, we did a really classic biochemistry experiment that um, it's perhaps sort of fallen out of favor because it uses radioactivity, um, radioactive amino acids. Um, so you have to be careful, wear double gloves and, and all that. Um, but it's a way to be able to measure how long proteins survive in the cell. And there's, re there's really no, no perfect substitute for it. But so we still use this technique. And what we found was that um, you don't have to know too much about how this works, but on the top, um, top 
plot in the top square, um, you can see the MR1 at the end of the very la last line of this gel, there's a bit of MR1 left. From 6 hours to 24, it does drop off, so it's being degraded a little bit. In the second box, the tyrosine mutant, Y303A, is um, is really prolonged, so you see a lot of more MR1 at that 24 hour time point. Whereas if we look, mutate the, the threonine, um, it's pretty much all disappeared. So this shows that not only is it uh, MR1 with these mutants, it's um, internalization being modified, but it's also how long it survives for. So we think these two processes are um, interconnected. So going on to slide 26, so just to summarize, what, what we think is going on is that MR1 seems to have this really Goldilocks um, motif where it's you know not too hot and not too cold. Um, so the, um, the cold version is the tyrosine mutant. So that tyrosine is really enabling the, um, the interaction with AP2 and essential for that. So if you mutate that, you get reduced endocytosis and it gets degraded really slowly. But then it, MR1 doesn't have that, that five valine residue. So if you put a valine residue there, then suddenly endocytosis in, increased really rapidly and degraded very fast. So MR1, we think, has evolved to have an interaction with AP2, but not too much interaction, just, just enough. That's why we think, I was thinking of the Goldilocks um, porridge. So just to summarize, so we think that this interaction um, is you know is really governing what's happening to mate cells and we think this is how it's how mate cells are not always um, activated and they're not always constantly secreting inflammatory cytokines because mr1 is controlled itself um, and that's in the residues in its tail and by what mr1 rec sorry ap2 recognizes so that's a bit of a whirlwind tour of one part of mr1 and um, perhaps you're not a cell biologist but um, I hope you can sort of appreciate that all all of our processes in our body, you know, are, are governed by these molecular interactions, um, many of which we just don't know about yet. And so this is one, the MR1, which controls your most abundant T cell in your body. Um, so there's a very last slide of acknowledgements, and I won't go through them all, but um, there's a lot of funding and people that I would thank, particularly my lab head, Jose, and Hui Jing, who did. Um, a lot of this work and it was great um, to work with Hui Jing for my first PhD student and um, she's now um, doctor. So yeah, thanks a lot. I think um, that's it. I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah. Thank you so much, Hamish. And please tell from us congratulations and good luck for the future uh, to your uh, previous students. Um, uh, yeah, this is really a beautiful work and this mechanism, I think, you know, or let me just ask, do you think, so first of all, do you think that, for example, in disease models, um, there would be maybe um, some sort of mechanisms that AP2 and MR1 interact too much uh, to have kind of a chronic inflammation um, state. Uh, do you do you think you know that yeah. would be the case? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think it's um, definitely possible. Um, we don't really know much yet, and this is probably the limitations of how far we've gone so far. So we're still trying to figure it out now. But I did show you earlier on that some cell types can um, in humans like in from human blood um, some cells seem to internalize mr1 much more quickly than others and so that suggests that there is some control over mr1 internalization but we haven't really uncovered that yet but one thing that's known is that um, proteins like mr1 on that tyrosine residue that can be actually modified itself like um, say phosphorylated and that prevents ap2 from binding so we haven't actually found that MR1 tyrosine is um, phosphorylated, but that could be, if that happens or something like that, any modification could be sort of, um, that occurs from another protein could be modifying how much MR1 is internalized. Um, but that could certainly- Yeah, that's risk, interesting. You know, yeah. Oh no, let's go ahead, <laughs> sorry. No, no, that's, that's it, yeah. 
Yeah, I think it's so interesting because, you know, when I read your paper, um, I kind of theorized like years ago that like diseases later on like Parkinson and, you know, all these different um, diseases that come later on and, and some people um, that maybe there is a tendency in those humans like to have an like an immune system that just doesn't stop or stops um yeah. doesn't really stop reacting like there's always a fire somewhere a fire signal going on and, and when i read this i thought it would be really cool in the future i mean if we could detect you know that's because this mechanism is on for too long and maybe we could predict mm. and like down regulate it in those people so they won't get Parkinson or, you know, in the ideal world in the future, <laughs> your discovery yeah. would lead to, okay, we can predict this. So let's give them something that this mechanism yeah. is not all on all the time and they won't get, I don't know, diabetes and, and, and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. I, I think you're right. And I mean, I'm not sure whether this this is involved, but there has been MI one is really conserved between in within the human population and even be, between mammals. But there is some mutations in MI one itself too, and um, I haven't looked yet to see whether there's any that are in the tail in this region that I was talking about. But that could also define you know overreaction of mate cells or underreaction. Um, but it, I think it's just important to know these processes because, you know, how would we interpret, say, gene um, um, mutations without understanding how the mechanics work? Yeah, thank you. And I'll pass the mic on to the next person. Um, so in PTR order on my screen is, um, I think, Katie, Eli, Dr. Shah, Denise, Les, just... Go ahead and, and Mike and thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Hamish, for your wonderful research. And I have two questions. And uh, my first question is about the using of the MR1 uh, for the CAR T cell. And uh, as you know, that uh, we are using for the monoclonal therapy and the cancer treatment for the CAR T. And another question that raised up after your presentation, because you mentioned about the uh, different ligand related with the MR1, which it can be included fully acid and B12 relevancy. My question is, did you find any relationship between eosinophil and condition related with eosinophil and uh, MR1? Uh, this is two questions and also about the APC. Uh, do you think that the previous exposure to the viruses can be related with the expression of the MR1 or not? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the questions. Yeah, so um, the first question about like the CAR T cell, um, I'm not really um, up to date on, on this. I know that there is people working on actually um, like CAR mate cells um so um but i'm, I'm I, I believe that's just because the, the good thing is that mate cells are conserved between humans and um they can be transferred that way and expanded um was there something specific about that that you had in mind um, yes there is a, there is some research out there about the car t cell uh, targeting mesothelia and uh, also they are using because we are when we are talking about the t cells specifically no matter it's a mucus related or not they can have a use in a core t cell therapy yeah yeah that's right yeah so i'm not sure how mr1 um uh, fits into it as well because one of the things that mr1 is generally not at the cell surface um to react um but um yeah, look, I, I'm, I'm not sure if, if how far people have got with mate car cells, um, car mates, but I know um, that that's... You mean yeah, non-canonical that... signaling? You are mostly focusing on the canonical or non-canonical signaling? Oh, for MR1? Yes. Um, yeah, with, 
essentially just understanding, I guess, how MR1, um, how MR1 signals to the mate cells. But by, you know, I guess for therapeutics, we were sort of thinking that by understanding how it works and how it gets turned off, we might be able to interrupt that with, say, small molecules that block this interaction and, and then cause the T cell to become activated even more. Yeah. Um, and so you're asking about eosinophils as well? Um, yes, because I, you talk about the B2, and I was wondering about the folic acid ligand related to MR1 and how they are related, or you think they might be related based upon the cytokines activation or not? Yeah, right. So, I mean, I know we haven't, we think that eosinophils don't express MR1 at all, which is, um, that's in mice anyway. That's a little bit, um, um, but the ligands themselves, um, there's there's some data coming out that MR1 can present these small MR1, uh, these antigens from various different metabolite um, and metabolic pathways, but the main ones come from bacteria. Um, but we have, I haven't found any data yet that's um, about like eosinophils being involved specifically or any pathways from eosinophils, but it's a really unknown area because it was only discovered like 10 years ago that MR1 binds metabolites at all. So there's a lot, there's several labs around the world. Um, and even there's a biotech company now looking at MR1 presenting antigens from um, tumor cells. Um, but there's just, yeah, a lot unknown. So any of the other innate like T cells could have their own type of metabolite pathways that enhance MR1 as well. Like, but we just don't know that yet. That's an interesting yeah, question. So are you, another question you asked about the antigen presenting cells and viral exposure and how that might impact MR1. Yes, um, because that, specifically that... about the APC. And you mentioned about bacteria. My question was related yes. to viral, virus. And I was wondering maybe you have further explanation. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's really interesting because um, one of the things early on was that they, uh, going back in the history, but they didn't know, the early scientists didn't know what MR1 was presenting, um, and, but they quickly realised that mate cells were never activated from a virus infection, it, but they were only activated from bacterial infection. So, um, and then later on, they figured out that it was um, some, some of my colleagues actually figured out that it was these metabolites that only come from bacteria, so not from viruses. But I think what you're asking is really interesting because, um, you know, obviously people that have a viral infection, they often get secondary infections later on and they can be bacterial. So we've wondered ourselves whether MR1 is um, after a viral infection there's some, you know, immune training going on or within the APCs that's pre preventing MR1 from um, functioning properly. And yeah, we, we have actually found various inflama inflammatory conditions in mice actually do decrease the MR1 presentation ability of these APCs, antigen-presenting cells. I haven't actually looked at viral infections yet, though. That's um, something we're interested to do. I guess this is what we're doing now. We're looking... Um, more at the in vivo role of MR1 antigen presentation and, and also what affects that. So, yeah, this is exactly what we're looking at. But I'll have to do the viral infection and get back to you. Now you mentioned exactly whatever I, I mean, and thank you so much for your answer. I'll pass the mic to the next person. No worries. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, Katie, Eli. Denise, Les, please go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Amish. That was a great presentation. I really appreciate the detail. Um, I had three questions. One, because I've never done this, how exactly is GFP, green, green fluorescent protein, added to um, a sample? I get that it starts with a vial, but then what? Yeah, yeah, that's no, a good question. So um what we do is we actually um do some like cloning like molecular cloning where you you sort of you know make up a chimeric gene, gene sequence of so you have mr1 normally at the end of the mr1 gene there's a stop codon so it means that the protein uh, finishes but what you can do is um 
this kind of cut and paste and put the GFP sequence directly after. So you take off the stop code on the gene and you have um, the, the sequence for the green fluorescent protein. Yeah. And then um, that means that uh, in those cells, so then you um, ask that you get those cells to express that gene and they'll make MR1 and, and just continue making GFP. And then it, you know, sort of miraculously folds in the, correctly in the cell. And so you have the MR1 protein in the membrane with the GFP um, hanging off the end. So it's all one big protein. <clears throat> so how long does that take? And is it like, what is the equipment involved? I'm just really curious about this. <clears throat> yeah, no, it's no worries. Um, it's a good question because, you know, there's probably a lot of things that I've said that maybe <laughs> didn't make sense because if you're in a very different area. Um, so, but basically, um, the process might take like uh, uh, maybe like a month or something um, or a few weeks to, to get going because you have to um, do various techniques like um, PCR, so um, polymerase chain reaction. Um, and they're very um, classic now, classic molecular biology techniques where you um, stitch the two genes together. And then you put it into a, a vector, which is like a plasmid, a, a circular piece of DNA. And then you can manipulate these viruses to um, inject that DNA into the cell that you're interested in. So a cell line that you're growing in culture, and then the gene will get inserted into the cell. So we're really, this is, you know, you know, when they say standing on the shoulders of giants, like these techniques have countless scientists have done every step and optimized and made these work. You know, it's a mystery to me almost how it works, but we can do it. So, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Thanks for that explanation. That definitely clears up some questions I had. Um, <clears throat> you had mentioned, if I didn't hear you wrong, AP2 timing is fleeting. And that's why it's difficult <laughs> to prove this. How, how fleeting is that? Yeah, so... Um, <clears throat> um, uh, let me see. I've got the... Basically... What, what happens is that ML, well, enocytosis itself, which is a process of, you know, parts of the surface of the cell, the plasma membrane, um, forming these little pits, and then they get pinched off into a little bubble kind of thing. And then that gets taken inside the cell. So that's called endocytosis. Um, and that happens in the, in, the, in the seconds, like say five to 10 seconds. But what AP2 does is even faster than that. So it binds to the proteins and then sort of collects them together into these pits because um, uh, it's the clathrin protein that binds to AP2 makes it this scaffold. Think of like a golf ball forming with like these scaffolds around it um, that sort of make it into a pit and then it becomes a ball another protein comes and pinches it off. So it's a, a ball that floats off from the membrane inside the cell. So that happens over seconds and the AP2 interaction, I, I can't tell you how, to, how fast it is. It, it, it may be the data's out there. I'm just not, I'm not sure, but I'd say it must be less than, you know, a couple of seconds. So it's sort of AP2 is binding, collecting proteins together, sending them into these pits and then once the pit becomes an actual like endosome of a ball inside the cell, the AP2 dissociates. It seems to happen very quickly. Well, that would, yeah. I mean, the order of seconds, you have to be at the right place at the right time with the right equipment. Yeah, exactly. That's all right. <laughs> yeah. And then the last question is how, um, you know, have you considered how your findings for this work apply to COVID? Is there, I'm sure there is some application. I'm just curious if you've considered it. Yeah, so um, we don't typically think of MR1 um, being really involved in viral infections because MR1 presents these bacterial metabolites, but there has been some work to show that, especially uh, in mouse models of influenza, <clears throat> I know it's very different to COVID, but and it's a, it's a viral infection and mate cells are, are actually important part of the immune response to viruses. And that was a bit of a surprise because MR1 doesn't present any antigens from, um, from viruses. Um, 
but it does show that in mate cells, their role in the immune system is probably more, um, is, you know, more important in other aspects like viral infections that we just don't know yet. But the mate cells are so abundant that you can't really ignore them. So there's been res uh, data to show that, you know, um, mate cells are almost like a canary in the, in the mining tunnels where, you know, as soon as something starts to go wrong with the canary, you know, there's a problem. And same with mate cells. So a lot of diseases, um, autoimmunity, diabetes, COVID, uh, mate cells um, start to, their numbers drop um, in, in these patients. So there's definitely something happening to mate cells. But going back to your question of, you know, is what we found, how does that relate to COVID? The only thoughts that I've had is that I think, um, um, and this is going back to a previous question as well, um, is that perhaps after a viral infection, if MR1 itself is impacted and not able to stimulate these um, mate cells very well, which we think is probably the case um, from other data, then that means that patient, people that have had COVID or a viral infection could be you know, at risk of getting um, lung pneumonia or um, some other viral infections because the MR1 is not working properly and mate cells themselves are also, um, they get, uh, reduced in numbers so it could be so yes i'm sure i think everything does come back to COVID at the moment for us <laughs> but it um, it could be something and and if we can manipulate mr1 it could be a way to also boost the numbers of mate cells back up because as, as i said they do drop it after COVID or during COVID, um and they get activated but with mr1 uh we if we could you know boost the mr1 presentation on our cells maybe we could also return the, the mate cell numbers to a normal level quicker than what normally happens. So I, I actually uh, searched this question during your talk. I, I you know, I uh, nearly went, there was a time I wanted to go into immunology and I, I still always uh, followed uh, it to some degree. Uh, so mate yeah. cells are, are new to me. So, so this is really interesting. Um, but I, uh, on this specific, uh, topic, there was a paper from, la from 2021, uh, Isabelle Nell at, uh, L'Université de Paris. Um, I'll, I'll read the specific, uh, uh, sentence that caught my attention, um, on, on SARS-CoV-2. Um, yeah. we and other groups recently unveiled alterations, uh, of mate cells during SARS-CoV-2, infection blood mate cells were significantly reduced in frequency while a highly activated high C cd69 cd56 uh interferon gamma and gzb expression and those parameters were linked with pulmonary function loss global inf inflammation levels and fatal el outcome of severe patients um elsewhere oh yeah here Mate cell frequency was increased in infected lungs and also displayed higher levels of CD69, GZB, uh, and PD1 compared to blood mate cells. Now, PD1 program uh, death receptor uh, protein, um, that is associated, elevation of that is associated with long COVID. Mm, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So basically, um, what, what's happening, <clears throat> what they're describing is that, you know, mate cells are decreasing in the blood, but they're probably, they, you know, they're going to the lung because that's the site of inflammation, infection. And um, so they're becoming activated. So they're expressing all those markers. Um, yeah, I think that's, um, yeah, that's really interesting. They're, they're probably, mate cells are being taken out of the blood, sending, you know, going to the lung and potentially causing um, further damage. Um Although, you know, it's, <clears throat> I'm not sure if it's like causative or cor correlation because mate cells, like I said, a bit of a, a canary, they, they do, they get activated, you know, very quickly. They can often be activated even without MR1. So that's probably what's happening. So even just some inflammation that's causing cytokines to be produced um, can cause mate cells to become activated and they secrete these inflammatory cytokines like interferon gamma that was that you mentioned and yeah that that's causing potentially further damage so and maybe so, in this so case the title what, of yeah so sorry go you, ahead oh i think um you know if we were going to try and manipulate mr1 maybe we'd actually in the lungs try and turn it off in case mr1 is actually further exacerbating the the 
this inflammatory mate cell response. So uh, the title yeah. of the article is uh, Mate Cells, Guardians of Skin and Mucosa, question mark. Um, they, like in the same paragraph that they talk about SARS-CoV-2, they also talk about influenza A virus. And there they note that uh, MR1 uh, double negative uh, um, cells are associated with worse outcomes. Okay, yeah. I'm not sure. What so I'll, I'll put the... the link to, to this paper in, in the room chat for you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I do know that one. Yeah, it's a yeah good review. Yeah, yeah, pop it in the in the chat. That'd be good. Thanks. That was all the questions I had. Who else would like to ask questions? So uh, actually, yeah, thanks, I thanks. did have a question. You you had the um, the slide with the uh, the various bacterial pathogens. Um, do you know if, uh, like, during natural bacterial infections, uh, they wind up uh, inside mate cells and are perhaps mate cells kind of a trap? Mm. Yeah, good question. It, um, I'm not aware of studies that have found them residing in mate cells, um, um, but, you know, they certainly could. I, I mean, a lot of bacteria, a lot of bacterial pathogens that want to get inside cells, they usually get into either phagocytes um, like macrophages because they're they're constantly eating bacteria anyway, and say like tuberculosis and um, some pathogens like to get in there and and they they end up making the macrophage their home. I'm not sure about T cells though, although look, I'm sure there is a pathogen that gets in, but a mate cell is like just another T cell but it does have important differences. Um, but, you know, I'm sure that there's some bacteria, we haven't found any, but I'm sure there's some that can manipulate mate cells. So maybe they boost, they increase the activation or they decrease. Um, and they, they don't seem to, be, they don't seem to be bothered by them. But for example, like tuberculosis, the bacteria that causes that mycobacteria, um, that does seem to um, be susceptible to mate cell activity. So there, um, the MR1 does present antigen from those and can stimulate mate cells. And um, there's various human data to show that that's, that's important in the immune response and um, mouse data as well. And, and also I'm wondering, uh, you know, you, since you brought up the difference between commensal and, and uh, pathogenic bac bacteria, um, is there a, a difference between commensal and uh, uh, pathogenic bacteria in terms of, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of like the, the, the soil microbiome where, where uh, uh, desirable uh, organisms get stuff from plants in exchange for the things they do for plants and uh, perhaps whether they are mm -hmm. getting the B vitamins so that they don't uh, metabolism, met metabolize uh, them on their own, and uh, maybe that's that's a way that that uh, uh, they don't induce uh, a response because they uh, have less of the metabolites. Yeah, so it's something that really fascinates me, and I'm it's something that I'd love to understand. Um, and I guess the way one important thing to think about is that. With these T cells, including mate cells, you know, as I just said at the beginning, is that they they need to be presented the antigen in in um, by another cell with a protein like MR1. So that allows this, uh, you know, a context or another story to be told at the same time. So it has this really good layer of regulation. So why that's important is because um, some labs. Um, and I'm thinking um, there's uh, Yasmin Belkade at her lab. I know that she's shown a lot that the microbiota can influence immune cells. Um, and But it's not what people normally think of in immunity during inflammation. It's like in the absence of inflammation. So antigen presentation can, can occur and it does certain things um, uh, to the immune response and, and the tissues that isn't really a bad thing. So for example... Um, what I think is important is that, you know, commensal bacteria, I don't think it's a bad thing that they have these antigens because 
if there's no inflammation in that tissue, say on the skin, then what happens is the MO1 probably presents their antigens, but there's no other inflammatory cytokines or signals going on. So the mate cells probably just say, okay, I'm detecting some MO1 here. Um, I'm just going to proliferate a little bit. I'm just going to sit in these tissues just in case something happens in the future. So I don't think there's really probably a difference as far as I know between commensals and pathogenic bacteria um, in their antigens they produce, um, like, like the MR1 antigens, the metabolites. It's just the context that happens. So probably things like um, a lot of tissue damage or maybe excessive amounts of the antigen because pathogenic bacteria are trying to multiply much more rapidly. Um, maybe these signals suddenly swing from a sort of normal, healthy antigen presentation, mate cell activation response to something that now mate cells are thinking, okay, this is actually starting to look bad. Now we'll start to... Um, start to not just proliferate, but we're actually going to start secreting cytokines and kickstart the immune response. Does that sort of answer your question? Uh, yeah, very much so. Thanks. Yeah, no worries. I think it's a, this is what I really find fascinating. You know, we don't know yet, but there's all these other clues from other fields of science sort of suggesting that it's all about the context from which the antigens are presented. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, the, anyone has any more questions? Um, I think Les, he left. Um, but um, let me check the chat so far. Um, so far, I think in the chat, please uh, raise your hand if you have any more questions. And uh, yeah, if you have follow up questions, anyone, please go ahead. Um, so what is the next step um, you're doing in the lab now um, or will do <laughs> when you go back? What are you planning to do um, next in this? Yeah. Yeah. So um, we're looking a little bit further. I've sort of got two main um, areas that um, we're pursuing in our team. So one is continuing this sort of cell biology because um, we think there's more to the story of the degradation of MR1, like how it, once it's internalized, um, there seems we know that it's degraded and, and how that's happening. Is, is that specific or not? Um, and also um, MR1, the, the antigens for MR1 get inside the cell somehow and we don't really know, that's not well described. So we're, we're trying to figure that out now, the pathway that these antigens, metabolites get imported into cells uh, in order to send them on to MR1. That's a that's actually a very unusual process. Um, the MR1 is deep inside the cell, but it's actually sensing something from outside the cell. And so we don't know that how, how that happens. Um, and so that's something we're pursuing as well. Um, however, the other part that I'm looking at is, <clears throat> it's a very basic question, but you know, which cells actually express the most MR1 in the body? And is there some cells that are specialized in presenting and um, making MR1 and presenting it? So we're looking at that in, in mouse models at the moment. And, um, and you know, what do some previous infections do to uh, MR1? Does that prevent um, MR1 presentation or not? And we have found that if mice that have had a bacterial infection, um, at least we've looked at now up to nine days after that and their MI1 expression in the main cells that express it is turned off almost completely. And that was really unexpected because we thought that, you know, during an infection, maybe MI1 would be turned up, you know, because it has a very low expression anyway. So, um, but it seems like after an infection, MI1 is turned off completely and we're not sure when it recovers yet. So that's what we're looking at. So we'd like to see if the same thing happens in humans and, you know, so we've had some really, I've had some great questions today because it's, it's, it is what we're sort of pursuing, you know, what's happening after a viral infection um, or a, a primary bacterial infection. Does that lead to, is the MR1 reduction, is that leading to increased secondary infections? And that's a possibility. So um, without giving too much away, that's what I think is, is happening. 
That Great. sounds really interesting, and yeah, I'm really curious to learn. <laughs> I can't wait <laughs> until mm. you uh, learn more about that because, yeah, as I said, I think it has so many implications how this um, mechanism works in like maybe chronic disease also. Yeah. Although you say it's yeah. relative specific to bacterial infection, but maybe it could give us a hint how the immune system and that person in general, like if it's overreactive, basically. There, there were a couple I mean, of other papers as I was, I was searching that uh, talked about mate cells being reduced after uh, COVID. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just probably the blood because that's, um, it's the blood's obviously easy to get from humans, you know, relatively, um, it's not very invasive. So that's the thing Like I was saying, it's like a canary because the mate cells always seem to go down. Every single disease, they seem to go down in the blood, but whether they increase somewhere else is um, often not known. But yeah, like you said before, they do increase in the lung during COVID. Yeah. That's always an interesting question, right? I mean, there, there was X quantity, now there's Y quantity, where'd the rest go? Yeah, exactly. And surprisingly, it's not that easy to say if they've died or um, proliferated or just gone somewhere else uh, well, in the, humans, at least. The, the fact that they're expressing PD-1 suggests that uh, apoptosis would be something to look for. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, it suggests they're exhausted and maybe, yeah, maybe about to die. Yeah. That's so, cool. so... Does the training, um, you know, the training of the system also for this mid cells, uh, do they, does it occur during development or are they cons like, how, how does it work? I'm sorry that I, I don't know that, but um, okay. is it, <clears throat> yeah. Oh, well, I think the short answer is probably not really well known, but um it's it's just emerging all the time like what mate cells are doing so there was a paper this week in immunity showing how they help repair like wounds in the skin um and i sort of mentioned that before that's been known for a little while but they've just gone a bit further there was a paper a few like a month ago in uh, nature immunology showing that mate cells are involved in maintaining the meninges around the brain um which was really uh, like sort of unexpected um but um so who knows like what they're playing in development i i don't think there's much that's known but i'll give you a brief idea is that when um when babies are born they have um like um, there's not that many mate cells but they over the next few years of life they start to expand and become the most abundant t-cell so by the time i think it's around the age of 30 um which i'm uh past <laughs> well past mate cells are at their peak and then they start to decline again later on. So um, mate cells could certainly be playing a role, but they, I can tell you that they, they expand a lot from, um, from the, uh, from birth um, and then sort of mature adult and they start to decline, but they could be having functions in the brain. They could be having functions in development. Um, you know, this, who knows? This, it just hasn't been looked at. So does it, the thymus play a role in this or, or not at all? Yes. Um, the, um, um, yeah. Yeah. So the thymus is where the mate cells are, um, are developed. So mate cells are sort of, um, they get trained in the thymus like, like other T cells and um, they leave the thymus and then um, expand more in the other, in tissues. Um, but, MR1 is uh, presented by um, certain thymocytes. Um, they're called double positive thymocytes, and and that instructs these developing mate cells um, to become uh, mature mate cells that leave the thymus. And one of the really interesting things, actually, uh, I think it was it was there was a paper. It was two years ago in Science from <clears throat> um, Olivia Lance's group in France. So he's a the pioneer of mate cells early on. So but he found that these metabolites that are from commensal bacteria um, in young mice, 
they actually, from those um, barrier tissues, like say the skin or the gut, those metabolites somehow get transported to the thymus and then they get presented by MR1 and that helps develop mate cells. And that was really unexpected because it's only been re- most, I think most immunologists consider the thymus a bit of a closed system where all the antigens come from within the cells in order to train T cells. But this is a case of where that it's a foreign antigen being transported inside in order to um, train these mate cells. So yeah, I'm not sure if that sort of answers your question. Yeah, that no, that's really interesting because I I heard or read shortly, but it was a while like a bunch of months ago that um, a, a, a medical researcher was trying to transplant thymus um, and um, it kind of trained, uh, it, it was not a big problem if you do it early enough during development because um, I think you, she trained the thymus uh, first in the dish and then transplanted it and there was no rejection yeah. and things like that um, yeah. combined yeah. with like the immune system you know for for cancer treatment I thought that was really interesting and then I thought uh, but the thymus training goes on really early in life but I thought that was interesting if you could basically also manipulate the thymus in order to I don't know, then yeah. improve if you have like, but that doesn't work yeah. in adults. Let's say you have a long-term COVID and the immune mm-hmm. system doesn't bounce back regularly. Could you train the thymus to train? <laughs> but that's yeah. late, right? That doesn't yeah. work anymore later on. So it was like a misconcept in my head, but that's interesting. Thank you. Yeah, so, I don't know. I think I'm open to other ideas. <laughs> it could be, could be something to pursue. <laughs> Yeah, and then would it, would the, like, epigenetics that maybe get inherited um, kind of, if, you know, modulate this? Like, could that mechanism be modulated by those mechanisms? Is there any hint that that would be the case? Yeah, not that I'm aware of, but, I mean, I I can imagine. I I have seen that different... um, human donors like that I've looked at their MI1 expression does vary and so we don't know why <clears throat> that could be epigenetics or it could just be yeah to do with the um the state of that person at that time it could be diet who knows but yeah it, it's yeah all open for I've got no idea but even just the expression of MI1 seems to change yeah that's interesting because yeah if if it's like a early developmental thing you know, that it's highly dependent on really relatively early stages in life, then maybe, you know, um, kind of environmental factors, maybe there's like a, a risky stage where you should be careful to not, you know, um, change that system, basically, if the yeah. epigenome would be able to modulate it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it would be worth, yeah, we need to know. I think we do need to know that. Yeah. That's interesting. So is there, um, is there like a large set of genetic data you could go through to see if, you know, in different populations, I don't know, genetics or, yeah, I don't know, methylation yeah. levels or so are, are changed? Yeah, I'm not really aware of it. I know, um, I know there's been some studies on looking at just the um, the gene sequences of MR1 and how it changes. It's very well conserved, but there is there's a few differences. Someone found that um, this is not yeah, so it's obviously not epigenetics when it when it's at the nucleotide level, but some there's a couple of there's like one single nucleotide difference in some people's MR1, and what they found is that it changes the expression of MR1. Uh, they think that it changes the expression. Oh, it's wow. fairly rare. Yeah, it's, it doesn't change it a huge amount, but actually they found it in a cohort of Vietnamese um, people and they had an increased susceptibility to tuberculosis. So 
it does suggest that MR1, you know, is in where mate cells are important in tuberculosis. But um, I think it was actually the mutation increased. They, they thought that it increased MR1 expression. Um, I believe it was like an in silico prediction. So I'm not sure if it panned out to you know, actually, if they did analysis in the humans in the people at all. But anyway, they found that increased MR1 increased the susceptibility to tuberculosis. So I'm not sure what's going on there. Yeah, that's interesting. I thought it would be maybe, you know, we had the guest speaker it was a completely different context, but she um, looks for her work through data sets from hunter and gatherers um, to kind of make evolutionary um, analysis, basically, because, you know, the assumption is that in hunter and gatherers that still live that lifestyle um yeah. there may be something conserved from back in time and then the you know the diet is very different you know more active lifestyle and so on so um it would be really yeah i i would be curious how you know if it would be different there if they would be less susceptible to bacterial infections and so I think that would be also interesting. Yeah. <laughs> there would be indefinitely yeah. a month of funding. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably. Well, I think you know. I think that the um, the MR one is 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 there to sort of monitor the the commensal, you know, commensals and the microbiome to some extent and instruct the immune response. That's what that's what my think my thinking is. Um, and you know in our western the western lifestyle that's been changing the microbiome significantly um uh, and so you know who knows like what mr and mate cells were like i'd love to know um but you know there's there's um it's it's clear that like mice are very clean the mice that we use in the lab they're called specific pathogen free spf mice they don't have many pathogens they also don't have many mate cells um it's hypothesized that that's you know if you if you can if you boost the the diversity of the microbiome that maybe mate cells will increase so maybe in humans as we're altering our microbiome our mate cells are not really being trained enough by the commensals but we're not sure about that yet yeah yeah and the, the microbiome diversity is also declining significantly in us, but also in our environment through, you know, extensive farming and, and pollution and so on. So yeah, that's, that's another yeah. very interesting aspect of your work. So um, yeah, we've been talking for like an hour and 40 minutes, I wanted to, you know, give back your time. <laughs> because <laughs> that's all right. I probably <laughs> Yeah. I think um, my toddler had a bit of a tantrum before. He's a, in, I don't know if any of you heard this, but he's a three-nager at the moment. He's three years old and he's, um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I hope that he's finished now, but I might need to go <laughs> and see how, how uh, my wife's going. Yeah. Um, I, but, I, yeah, I hope all is well. <laughs> well no, th sure. Thank you for a fascinating talk. No worries. My pleasure. Thanks for the great questions. It's been, uh, I love being able to talk to people from, you know, very different backgrounds and their different thinking. So thanks. Hi, it's Katie. I just also wanted to say thank you, Hamish. She did an amazing job um, really, you know, breaking down some very complex um, terms and everything like that, communicating very well. Um, welcome to Clubhouse as well. I hope you come back and join us. Um, and just really, really quickly, because I'm fascinated by your research, I also went down a rabbit hole during your talk. Um, and if you do want any blood samples from people that have had COVID or have long COVID um, to test yeah. this, you, you, please get in touch because I can get you in touch with um, different labs around Australia uh, studying oh. this sort of stuff. Um, but also, if we want to follow up with your research, do you have, you mentioned a Twitter account before, like how do we follow up with you um, and follow your work? I also posted an article to, from, I think, your university in the chat below as well. But um, if you can share your Twitter handle, we'd love to follow you there. Yeah, no worries. I'll put it in the chat. I also put it on my slides. Um, um, so I'll just put it in quickly. It's 
It's HMCW underscore science. Um, that's my Twitter. I just put it on the chat. So, yeah, I'd love anyone to get in touch on Twitter. And, yeah, while Twitter's still around, it seems like it's hanging on for a bit. <laughs> but, yeah, no worries. Thanks so much. Um, so so, so are, are, are you planning to, to go on to, uh, like, uh, Science Mastodon? Uh, there are a couple of good ones. I would like to. I, I you know, it's just it was all, it's been in the hard basket at the moment. But I, I was just waiting to see what happened. But um, it sounds like a lot of people are moving there. Yeah, I haven't signed up yet, but I, I need to check into that. Yeah, I need to check yeah. that out too. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Okay, thank All you right, so thanks. much, Hamish. Uh, say thanks to your kids for, you know, making, like, letting us share, like, sharing you with oh, us. No and, worries, yeah. Um, yeah, it was a wonderful no discussion. Thank you so much. No worries. Thanks. Thanks so much and, for the invitation. And, yeah, I'll, I'll see you around in Clubhouse soon. Yeah, and, and enjoy your summer while we suffer. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, no thanks everyone for coming. <laughs> and, thanks so much. Um, yeah, and follow the club if you like discussions like this. And um, the next discussion will be um, with Dr. Benjamin. He was actually in the audience uh, earlier listening, and um, he will talk about naturally emerging neural codes um which is really interesting uh and you really interesting neuroscience uh, topic so yeah i hope i hear you all back soon and um yeah enjoy the rest of your day hamish and uh, everyone and i'll close the room and three two one bye everyone yeah. thank you